chapter 20 is where we're at this morning. And we're going to read uh, the first 11 verses of this chapter. And then we're going to preach a sermon that's not necessarily an Independence Day, 4th of July sermon, but it is a, a sermon for Christians along the theme of uh, living for God and fighting the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. So I think it's kind of appropriate. 1 Kings chapter 20. Verse 1, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria, and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. Uh, here's the Syrian king coming up and sending a message to the king of Israel saying, you know what, all your stuff is now mine. I own your property, your houses, your banks, your cars, your boats, your guns, your wives, and your kids. That's what he's saying to him. Verse 4. And the king of Israel answered and said unto him, uh, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold, and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants. And it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold, and I denied him not. That's Ahab, the king of Israel. Ahab was, one, was married to Jezebel. I'll tell you some things about Ahab. Uh, verse number 8. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Here's his advisors, his cabinet. They said, King, what are you doing? Don't, don't give in to him. Verse 9. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that thou didst send for thy servant, At the first I will do, But this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed, And brought him word again. And Ben-Hadad sent unto him, And said, The gods do so unto me, And more also, If the dust of Samaria Shall suffice for handfuls, For all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, Let not him that girdeth on his harness Boast himself as he that put it off. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for this day and for your blessings. And we thank you, God, for this passage of Scripture that we've read. And we pray, God, that you might help us, Lord, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to teach, preach, and instruct from the Word of God this morning. And that it might be a blessing and encouragement to God's people. And we pray, God, for anyone that's lost, they might be saved, of course. And help us, God, today, we pray to be better servants and better soldiers for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to preach a message this morning uh, called Finish the Fight or Fight On. Fight On. Uh, look at verse number 11 here. And here you have the king of Israel, which is Ahab. Again, not a good king in the Bible. He was one of the wicked kings in the Bible. But yet he was a man of battle. Uh, he was a man that uh, did fight many battles in his lifetime. And he says in verse 11 to this king of Syria, uh, Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that put it off. In other words, what he's saying is this. He's saying, I'm an experienced soldier. He said, I've put the harness on and taken it off many a time. And he said, I plan to take, take, put it on take it off again this time because I'm going to win. And he says to this king, he said, don't boast yourself like me. He said, you're just now putting it on. You're just now getting started. You're, you're new at this. I'm experienced. And so he's saying this. He's saying, don't boast yourself against me because you don't know what you're dealing with. That's what he's saying here. Now, the only king, um, uh, this, by the way, verse 11 here is the only thing that King Ahab ever said that was worth remembering. Amen. That's the only thing he ever said that was good that was worth remembering. Um, even a busted clock is right twice a day. Amen. He got this one right. And it's the truth what he speaks there. It's a true statement. Uh, it could, it's a principle that can apply to anything. And uh, truth is truth wherever you find it, no matter who said it. Amen. Um, in those days, uh, you fought your enemy one-on-one, hand-to-hand, face-to-face. 
Uh, you could literally smell the breath of your enemy in those days. Uh, there were no ships off the coast lobbing uh, shells on enemy positions or airplanes dropping uh, bombs from 10,000 feet. It was up close and personal when they fought these battles back in that day. Now, let me say this. In the Christian life, we're in a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle, though sometimes it may get physical, and it has in the past. But in the Christian life, we're in a spiritual battle, and the stakes are high. Every one of us that are saved are on the winning side, amen? And the outcome is sure. We are going to win the war. But there's going to be battles and skirmishes along the way, and uh, there's going to be some downtime in between. And even if we get killed in action, we're still on the winning side. Amen. Uh, our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. That is the uh, ungodly society around us, our own stinking self-flesh, and Satan also. Those are our true enemies that we fight as Christian people. Um, now, we, we must fight for our family's sake, for our friends' sake, for our schools, for our churches, our country, our rights. Um, staying in church, staying in the Bible, staying in prayer, uh, continuing to witness to lost souls. That's all part of the battle that you and I are in as Christian soldiers. Amen? Uh, and it's a real battle. Even though sometimes you can't see the enemy, per se, it is a real battle that can't be treated lightly uh, or like a social event. Uh, look at verse number 12. It came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message, which was kind of a threat from Ahab to him, as he was drinking, uh, he and his, the kings and the pavilions, and he said to his servants, set yourselves in array, and they set themselves in array against the city. That is, they, they organize themselves, they assemble themselves for battle. And he's drinking while he's doing that, like it's no big deal. Um, if, now, I said this, I said that this is a real battle, and it's not a social event that we're attending when we get in this battle. It reminds me of uh, the, bat, the, bat, the first battle of Bull Run uh, in the Civil War. Uh, the Yankees from Washington, D.C. went out to watch the ridge, watch from the ridge. That is, uh, all the Yankees in Washington, when this battle took place between the Confederates and the Union soldiers at the Battle of Bull Run, it was outside of Washington, D.C., uh, they went out there in their carriages and uh, with their picnic baskets and lunches and things like that, and they sat on a ridge to watch the Union soldiers just send the rebels running back to uh, Virginia where they came from. Only that didn't happen. What happened was is that the Confederates, uh, they uh, defeated the Union soldiers, and the Union soldiers were trying to run back to Washington, and they had a hard time getting back because all these civilians were trying to get back out of the, out of the battle, out of the line of battle with their wagons and their, and their baskets and their uh, carriages and things like that. They went out there just to watch as it was entertainment, and it turned out they were in the battle themselves just about and slowed up their own people and got a lot of them killed, probably. They thought it was just a spectator thing. Well, uh, this is a real battle. It's not to be taken lightly. And again, it's not a social event that uh, we are involved in. Uh, this is also a personal battle. That is, uh, you can't get someone else to fight your fight. You can't hire a mercenary to go in your place. In the Civil War, if you paid somebody $300, uh, if you paid the government $300, they'd let you off and get somebody else that was poorer than you to go in your place, amen? You know what? In this battle, it's a personal battle. You've got to fight it for yourself, amen? You can't hire nobody to go in your place. And let me say this about uh, the fight. Uh, it doesn't matter how you finish the fight as long as you finish the fight. Uh, you may not look pretty when you come across the finish line. doesn't matter. You may be haggard, beaten, dirty, and tired and exhausted, but you finish nonetheless, and that's all that counts is that you finish the fight. Amen? Amen? It's not necessarily how you start. It's how you finish. And you want to finish the fight. You want to fight on. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Timothy, Paul wrote this to Timothy, the young preacher. He said, we're supposed to fight the good fight of faith. And we're to earnestly contend for the faith, Jude said. And then Paul said again, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So we're to gird on our harnesses, that is our spiritual armor, the armor of God, the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us about that. We're to put our, our harnesses on, just like Ahab mentions here in this text, and we're to get in the battle, and we're to fight on, and we're to finish the fight that we started. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. Now, I'm going to give you several things here about finishing the fight. Let me say this. Number one, 
We, you and I, as Christian soldiers, let me, let me just let me just preface this by saying this: We're not talking about the Crusaders in the in the Middle Ages that were sent out by the Pope to go down there and claim is claim the Palestine for Christianity. That wasn't Christianity. They weren't Christian soldiers going down there. They were just a bunch of heathen that were pretending to be Christians and went down there to take something that they wanted. For the Pope. Uh, that's not us. The Pope doesn't represent us. He's not our manager, amen. He's not our superior. He's not our boss. He doesn't speak for us, amen. Uh, the Pope needs to get saved, amen. Uh, now, that stuff back then, people use that and criticize Christians and say, well, I'm a Christian soldier. That reminds me, you got, a, you got a cross on your shield and you got banners waving, yeah, all that kind of stuff, but it's a spiritual fight we're in. And any fight we get in physically is going to be self defense. It's not us trying to convert you to the point of a sword. Amen? That's not Christianity. So I just want to clear that up, all right? So, again, this is a spiritual... I know a lot of people that are non-Christians, particularly on the liberal, liberal uh, uh, side of the, of the thing, uh, they just they get all worked up about this. Well, you're all going to go out there and fight, are you? No, we're not Antifa, amen? We're not BLM. We're just we're conservative Americans who believe in liberty and freedom... And we're also Christians who believe in doing right and serving God and being sold, good soldiers of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we go out and we beat people up and we club people to death and we take guns and swords and knives and bombs and go out there and try to get our... We don't go out there and you know have a terrorist act and go, you know, after we've blown up a building or something, go, Jesus saves! <laughs> you know, we don't do that. It's Allah Akbar. <laughs> Okay. Nobody goes out and says, Jesus saves! To make a political religious point and blows up a bus and kills themselves at the same time. Amen? We just don't do that. We're totally different. Amen? All religions are the same. I'm sorry they're not. I just gave you an ex a, a, a good example of why they're not the same. Amen? But anyway, on with the message. Amen? Uh, fight, let me say it. Number one, fight on no matter what people say. Fight on no matter what people might say. Uh, and we've read here what Ahab, what, what uh, uh, Ben Hadad here said to um, uh, the king of Israel. Here, he, he scared him. He frightened him. He gave in for the first time, and then he got emboldened because he talked to his advisor, and they said this to him: "This is what you need to do. Fight on, no matter what people say." And look what they said in verse number eight: "What, what, what do you do when people say things about you negatively or against your religion, your Christianity, things like that, trying to get you to stop, get you to quit?" Look at verse 8. All the elders and all the people said unto him and the king, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. In other words, don't listen to it. Don't listen to them. And don't hearken to them. Amen. Don't give in to these people that are anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Bible, and trying to make you feel like you're a fool of some kind. Amen. Uh, don't do that. So, fight on no matter what people say, whether it's good or bad. Amen. Um, fight on no matter what they say to you. Again, here's Ben Hadad, the king of Syria. He was using words really as psychological weapons against Ahab. He was using scare tactics and mind games with him. He was trash talking, trying to psych him out. That's what he's doing. Hadn't even fired a shot yet. Hadn't even assembled for battle yet. But he's just talking. He's just talking trash right now. See, and he's got Ahab all worried. Um, I remember uh, when I was in basic training in the Air Force. Um, that uh, I was pulling guard duty one night, which was something everybody had to do. Had two-hour shifts uh, all during the night and things like that. And um, no one without an identification card uh, showing who they were could get in the building. And so here I am walking around here in the in the barracks, and I'm you know, it's tired. I got a flashlight, you know, and I'm a new recruit. You know, I don't, I don't really know what's going on. And uh, here comes this guy knocking on the door, and it's some major. And he's out there saying, let me in, let me in. I said, sorry, sir, I can't let you in. I need to see your ID card. What do you mean you need to see my ID card? Who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? No, sir, I haven't seen your ID card yet. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he's hammering on the door, and he's, he's yelling, screaming, cursing me out, calling me everything in the book, trying to get me to open that door. He's trying to psych me out. All I know is I've got orders, and the orders are, Nobody enters this building. You don't open that door for anybody that does not have an ID card. He had a uniform on. He had all his insignia on. Had his, uh, had his major uh, uh, insignia on there and stuff. I mean, I knew what he was. Had his name on there, but I got to see his ID card. He could have been a terrorist or something who had just simply put on a uniform and stole it from the guy he killed or something. All right. So anyway, I didn't let him in. 
So I passed the test, amen? But that's what that was. That was a psychological attack. And that was to get you to basically uh, 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 toughen up so that, you know, words don't hurt you and you're not going to give in to somebody just because they're jumping your case, amen? Um, you take, uh, what do people say? Well, professed orthodoxy. That is, people who profess to be orthodox Christians, uh, many times they'll recite uh, the creeds and they'll say they adhere to some religious creed uh, they'll say they believe the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, and they quote all these things. We believe this stuff. We're mainline Christian stuff like that. They may even say that there are even fundamental Christians and conservative Christians and Southern Baptists and Independent Baptists, and they believe the King James Bible or whatever. They can say all kinds of stuff, but you know what? Talk is cheap. Right. Some people talk a good game, but they don't play a good game. And some people just talk. Oh, they've got the books. They've got the tapes. They've got the videos. Um... Uh, there and many of these people are not pastorable, uh, and they're not profitable in the ministry of the local church. Some people can't be pastored, and some people are going to say stuff to you as a Christian. Say, "Well, I can't believe your pastor said that. I can't believe your pastor believes that. I can't believe you believe that." And they're going to try to get you to feel like you're an idiot because you believe stuff that's right according to the Bible. Uh, and they may be. People that pretend to be Christians that are saying stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and these people may be those who preface their comments and their concerns and their testimonies uh, and everything they say and their advice and stuff by letting you know that they're one of the best Christians you've ever met and they really love the Lord. And, they, and in doing that, they're trying to make you think that you don't sometimes. It's a psychological attack. It's a spiritual attack. Uh, then there's those who have political posturing. Uh, there's church politicians. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about politicians that run for office. I'm talking about in church. There's, there's, a, there's church politicians. Uh, they jockey for position in a church or a ministry. Uh, they use language and rhetoric to paint a false or fanciful picture of others and their motives in order to deceive other people and to letting them move into a position or something. Just like politics. I mean, if you're, if you're in church long enough, you could probably be a good politician, some of you. You know that? Um, and I've met some and, and had some in church. Um, and by the way, when they try to tell you how good they are and stuff, most people aren't really as good as the resume. Amen? Most of the time they pat it, embellish it, you know, with, uh, other than, with, with the unvarnished truth, right? It's not always accurate. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of preachers and Christians who started out talking big. And uh, some people get in the ministry and they say, I'm going to show them how it's done. And they're trying, to get, they're trying to get the most hits on YouTube, you know. I'm still trying to go viral, man. Uh, but I know some people out there that they're, they're just get all kinds of hits, get all kinds of followers and stuff like that. That's because they, 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 it's because they try to, you know, they're trying to they preach all this fantastic, sensationalistic stuff, get people's attention lots of times. Uh, and some of them are even pastors. Some of them are just sitting home, you know, not going to church anywhere, but you know, they feel like they, it's their business to get out there and teach the Bible to everybody. Hey, if you're not in the church someplace, uh, where, there's good where there's good church around, uh, and you don't have any business teaching the Bible, right, right. you ought to be in a church if you've got a good local church in your area, amen? You have to drive an hour to get there, amen? But uh, anyway, uh, uh, people are going to say things to you to try to get you to quit. As a pastor, uh, as a Sunday school teacher, just as a church member, they're going to say things to you to try to make you feel bad about yourself and question uh, you know, your, uh, your faith and get you to, you know, they're trying to undermine your faith and your confidence in what you believe about the Bible and things like that. But uh, um, so I'm, I've, I've, here's some statements I've heard in the past. A uh, preacher, if you ever leave, we're packing our bags and we're leaving with you. Amen. I haven't left yet, but some of them did. <laughs> uh, preacher, you couldn't run us off with a stick. I didn't even have to use a stick. <laughs> Amen, they were gone. Uh, preacher, we've been members of this church for 30 years and nothing's going to make us leave. We're here to the end. That was the last time I saw them. <laughs> Every preacher has these experiences, amen. Every church that you've been in, if you had experience in a lot of churches, and hope, here we, thankfully, we got a good group, amen. And so I'm just preaching the choir right now. But uh, here's another one. Preacher, we're behind you 100%. And then they stabbed me in the back and helped push me out the door, amen. Uh, and after I left one place, 
uh, that I passed over. That happened actually. Um, one of the persons that was there that was 100% behind me, I hadn't, hadn't seen him in over a year, you know, and then I looked in the paper and I saw where it said there that he had been sentenced to one year for abusing his daughter. He was the song leader. You know what that tells me? You can't trust Christians. <laughs> Amen. You can't trust, I mean, you can trust Christians, but you can't trust people who just say they're Christians. And some of them look like they're Christians. And they may be saved people. But you know what? There's some people out there that's mixed up, messed up, and they'll corrupt you and your family and your kids. And so they'll say things, they'll say all kinds of things to you. Uh, and they say things to you to try to fool you, to fool you into. Uh, not believe in what you believe and not stand for what you stand for or try to fool you into doing something that, uh, that you ought not be doing. They'll fool you. You've got to be very careful with people. Jesus said beware of men. You've got to be careful. Uh, let me say this also. Fight on, no matter what people may say, and not just what they say to you, but what they might say about you. You know what people are going to do? They're going to talk about you. You know there's people talking about you this week? Uh, my grandson, Noah, he talks about one of the church members here every day. Jimmy. I tell you, that's probably the most used word in my house right now in the last month. Jimmy. We go by our fire station. Jimmy. Jimmy at the fire station? Yeah. Jimmy help people? Yeah. Jimmy. Jimmy or Jimmy. Jimmy cut grass. Jimmy this, Jimmy that. He's, he's got a reputation in my house. Amen. So, um, anyway, but it's all good stuff he says about you. Amen. Um, but people are going to talk about you. You know what They're also going to lie about you. Um, and they're going to lie about your church. They're going to lie about your preacher, your Sunday school teacher. They're going to lie about your Bible. They're going to lie about your commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they're going to do all these things to try and defeat you and get you down in your spirit. Uh, Sanbal, who was the uh, governor of Arabia, or uh, Samaria, that is, back in the book of Nehemiah, the Bible said he mocked the Jews to try to get them to stop building the wall. Um, what you've got to do is this when they say things about you, is don't react. Don't flinch at criticisms, whatever they might call you. Uh, don't, uh, don't get into that. Don't consent to it, uh, and don't let what they say about you stop you or slow you down. Um, uh, Ulysses Grant was called a damnable, bumbling drunk. Yet he won the war and became the president. And from what I understand, he wasn't the bumbling drunk that they said he was. But they said that about him. Um, you, know the, you know what the British did for Napoleon? You know why everybody thinks Napoleon's short? Right? Why is he so short? <laughs> Actually, he wasn't short. That was the British press and the government put that out there that he was short to make it look like, you know, that, you know to make him feel small and to mock him and ridicule him. He wasn't that short, really. But everybody thinks he was. Uh, it was propaganda. Why? To try to undermine him and undermine the faith of his own troops in him. See? Um, and you take uh, Lincoln was called a long-armed gorilla. Uh, Robert Lee, right, E. Lee was called Granny Lee by the Union. Uh, Jackson was called Tom Fool Jackson. Dale Moody, the great evangelist, was called Crazy Moody. They called him Crazy Moody. He's just crazy. He'll preach on a street corner. He'll throw a hat down and and then jump around the hat and say, looky here. And everybody, what's in the hat? And he pulls it up, it's the Word of God. Amen. They do anything to get attention, man. Chicago needs another D.L. Moody, they say. Amen. Uh, but anyway, and then uh, Billy Sunday was called a charlatan. They made a movie and a book about him where they mocked him and uh, accused him of being a religious charlatan, which he wasn't. Uh, when the Union General Pope took command of the Union Army, he told him his last command that he commanded only saw the backs of their enemies. He said, where I came from, my last command, all we ever saw were the backs of our enemies because we had them on the run all the time. And uh, he said the same would be true again when he took over the army. His headquarters were in the saddle. Uh, Lee said of him, his, this is Lee, his enemy, he said of Pope, he said his headquarters are where his hindquarters are. <laughs> um, and uh, so anyway, later on, Pope lost to the south. Um, but Jack, that was a pretty good one there by, by about him. Uh, Union General Hooker bragged. He said, I have Lee in my back pocket. Not even God could deliver him from me. Three days later, Stonewall Jackson defeated him on the battlefield. Uh, General Burgoyne, commander of the British troops at Boston, 
said the American army was a, pr a preposterous parade and a rabble in arms, just farmers with pitchforks. Within months, the British were forced to leave Boston by this ragtag bunch of American farmers. The greatest army in the world, the greatest navy in the world at that time, ragtag farmers, chased them off, amen? Uh, we credit that, of course, to God giving us victory. Uh, so fight on no matter what people might say and no matter what you may say. Um, one of the greatest apostles of Christ, of course, was Simon Peter. Simon Peter. And um, he said this. He said, the night that Christ was going to be betrayed, he said, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. But he spake the more vehemently. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. So here's Simon Peter, who's zealous, but his zeal hasn't been really tested at this point. And he comes out, and he's got a lot of bravado, and he's braggadocious about this. And he says, the Lord says, you're all going to forsake me tonight. Simon Peter says, Lord, not me. Everybody else, all this other group, you can all be offended, but not me. I'll even go to jail for Christ. I'll die for Jesus. You know what? They all ran that night. And they all said, it said they all said the same thing. They, all, they said when Peter was saying that, they said, amen, Peter, that's right, Peter. Yeah, amen, Peter, preach it, Peter. Yeah, we're not going nowhere. And they all fled that night. You know what? No matter what you say, don't let that stop you. Uh, you may say some dumb things and some stupid things, and you probably have and you're going to. And when you do, just repent of them and just say, Lord, that was a dumb thing I said. I'm getting up and I'm getting back in the battle. I'm going to finish the fight. I'm going to fight on and in spite of the fact that I said something stupid. Uh, you know what? When you're, wait, If you're preaching in the pulpit, every preacher probably says some dumb things in the pulpit. I've heard them say some dumb things. <laughs> I probably said some dumb things. And when I do, you know what I do? I go home and I edit them out of the sermon <laughs> that I put on YouTube. See? Um, but um, anyway, no matter what you may say, you can still fight on. Uh, what matters is what God says, amen? amen? What matters is not what anybody says or you say, it's what God says. And what you need is a word from God uh, to help you and give you victory assured. Uh, look at uh, in our chapter here. Look at verse number 13. Behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord. This is what Ahab needs right now. He's facing this battle, and he's facing the odds are against him. And uh, the numbers are against him. And even he himself was against himself earlier because he said he was going to give in to them. But then he got strengthened by the brethren there who said, Hey, don't listen to me. Here comes a prophet and says to him, Thus saith the Lord. Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So God gives him a word there through the prophet and says, You know what? You're going to win this battle. Verse 14, Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. In other words, you're going to lead the charge, and you're going to win this fight. Look at verse number um, uh, 28. Verse 28. And there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he's not the God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So God sends a prophet, a prince that sent two preachers to him, say, Hey, this is what God says. And it strengthens him and encourages him in the battle. You know what? That's what you and I need is a word from God. That's when we read the Bible. Sometimes we'll read the Bible and the verse will just pop out of it, pop up out of, almost off the page at us. And that's God saying, hey, here's what I want you to know. Here's what you need right now. Here's a couple of verses that are good. Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right. Here's another good one. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are victors through Jesus Christ. We're conquerors through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Even if you get killed in battle, you still win. Amen. Because you got heaven. Well, let me say this. Fight on no matter what people may say. Also, fight on no matter what the odds are. Fight on no matter what the odds are. Um, and uh, so when you look at this thing here, look at this. Uh, he says um, in verse uh, 30, in verse number 1 there, verse number 1, uh, he says there that, uh, how many kings are there? It says, uh, the king of Syria gathered all his hosts together. There's the king of Syria. And there were 30 and 2 kings. 30 and 2 kings. There was 32 other kings and armies 
that have uh, banded with Syria and they're going against King Ahab. So the odds are against him. So we say this, fight on no matter what the odds are. No matter what the odds are. You can't count on numbers and percentages in this spiritual battle. Uh, the fact is that no matter what the odds are, whether they're stacked in your favor or against you, you're on the winning side. And either you're either going to lose this battle or you're going to win this battle. You're either going to live through this battle or you're going to die in this battle. But you're still in the battle. And you still got to fight, amen? So you might as well fight on and die with your boots on, as they say, and not quit. Uh, Washington's Continental Army that went against the, the, the most powerful army in history at that point, the British Army, the Washington's Continental Army lost more battles than they won, but they won the war in the end, which was really a miracle. It was a miracle that happened. Um, they, were, they were wanting to... Uh, fire George Washington more than a few times because he was not winning the battles. He was always on the run. But he finally won the war. Uh, the modern nation of Israel uh, has faced overwhelming odds in the struggle for their existence. In 1948, uh, they were outgunned and outnumbered by the Arab nations on the very night of their birth as a nation, and the Israelis won a decisive victory in spite of the numbers. In 1967, which is one of the most talked about victories in history, Israel defeated the invading Arab uh, armies in what's known as the Six-Day War. Um, when David was a teenage boy in the Bible, uh, he faced the giant Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And uh, David said this to the Philistine who was, again, Goliath was trash-talking them. When you read the story there, he was uh, denigrating them. He was talking bad about their king and this and that and whatever, about their country. And David uh, decided he was going to take up uh, the task of going to fight Goliath. And he said this. This is what David says to the Philistine. The Philistine says, you, you send me a little stripling. You send me a little kid here that's going to fight me. I've been fighting all my life. Just like Ahab said. Goliath had put on the harness and taken it off many a time. Plus he was about nine feet tall. David you know, all he'd ever done was kill a lion and kill a bear. That's pretty good. So anyway, he's got less experience, though, than the Philistine. Then David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. So David goes out there with a pocket full of rocks and a sling, and he kills Goliath in one shot. Why? Because God helped him, amen? God helped him. God gave him the victory. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Marine Gen General Chesty Puller? Okay. Chesty Puller was... I guess he's still the, the most famous Marine, probably. And uh, from what I understand, uh, that at least last time I talked to Marine, they said in boot camp, we always say before we go to bed, Chesty Puller, where are you? They're looking for him. This is what he did. He was in the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir in Korea, a famous battle. And here he is, and uh, they're fighting the uh, uh, they're fighting the Koreans there in North Korea, and, they're, and the Chinese are getting in on it. Uh, to try to help them out. And here he is, he, be he becomes surrounded uh, by just an innumerable number of Chinese. And uh, one of his uh, officers comes to him and says, uh, General, General Polar, sir, we're surrounded. And then Polar said this, he said, then we've got them right where we want them. He said, we can shoot in any direction and kill them. <laughs> that was Chesty Polar, amen. And he got he, he got he got his troops out of that situation, and uh, uh, he uh, he didn't win the battle, I don't think, but he did. Uh, they were able to, to get out of there. Um, so Bob Jones Senior said this to Christians. He said, "You and God are a majority. You and God are a majority. So if you're the only one standing where you work or in your family or uh, where you go to school or among the people that you know, you're the only one that you you're the only Christian you know that's actually standing for God. There, guess what? You and God are a majority." You can do, still do right. You can still do battle for the Lord. You can still witness. You can still pray for people. You can still read your Bible and go to church. You can still have an influence on other people there. And if you keep standing for God, uh, some people are going to be drawn to you. They'll be drawn to you. Uh, genuine Bible Christianity has always been in the minority. 
Uh, and if it hasn't been the minority, it's usually been at least at a disadvantage many a times. Uh, you take in America, um, uh, we're, this is a, this is a, 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 I'll just say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, a, 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 what's the word? Uh, it's, um, it's not the rule, but it's the, uh, what's the, what do you say? It's not, it's, it's the uh, exception. America is the exception to the rule of what Christianity, Christian history has been about. Right. And that is that Christianity has mostly been persecuted, mostly have been in the minority, mostly have been underground, <clears throat> mostly have been outlawed and illegal and things like that. Um, the, um, in, in the beginning even uh, of our country, Patrick Henry, you all know him, he's once said, give me liberty or give me death. Uh, Patrick Henry was an Episcopalian, which is basically the Church of England Americanized. Um, and uh, the Episcopal Church was the state church of Virginia. Well, you couldn't preach without a license from the Episcopal Church. Well, the Baptists kept on preaching. And they would be arrested for preaching without a license by the by, because of the Episcopal Church being the state church of Virginia. This is before the revolution took place. Patrick Henry defended a number of Baptist preachers. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you, if you look at history and look online, you might be able to find it. Uh, there was many of preachers that preached from jails to their congregations. They'd be there behind bars preaching the Bible on Sunday morning to their congregation that came to church to hear their preacher preach from behind bars in the local jail. They defied the government by doing that. Um, there were preachers that were tied up by British soldiers to trees and they were whipped publicly on the streets because they preached without a license. Patrick Henry defended many of those people. He was a friend of the Baptist. Um, after a while, <clears throat> they uh, did this, and that is that the, uh, uh, they start, the, Thomas Jefferson uh, wrote what was called the, uh, uh, the Statue of Religious Liberty for Virginia, uh, one, of the, one of the most important documents in history. And uh, when he wrote that, um, um, there were people that were against it. They were against it because they wanted the Episcopal Church to be the state church, not Jefferson, and not, not the Baptists or the Methodists or the Presbyterians. They didn't want that either Why? because they were being persecuted by the Episcopalians. And so when they started to do this, they tried to compromise on that bill. They said, we'll tell you what we're going to do. We don't want the Episcopal Church to lose its status as the state church. So what we'll do is we'll offer the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Methodists to be also elevated to, you know, state churches, but not the state church. And the Baptists said, if it's wrong for you to have that stature, and that's what we've been preaching about, it's wrong for us too. And the Baptists said, no, we don't want to be a state church. Amen. And the Methodists and Presbyterians said the same thing. No, we don't want a state church. We want religious freedom. We want every church to be able to worship God. Um, and the Baptists, for instance, there one of the one of the men that uh, was uh, defended by Patrick Henry, um, uh, he was uh, 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 typical of this. Anyway, uh, he was fined, he was imprisoned, uh, forbidden to preach unless he changed his denomination and became an Episcopalian. Otherwise, he couldn't preach. He had to stay in jail. That's not America, Amen. That's part of why America has a First Amendment, religious freedom. It's due to Baptists in Virginia and Thomas Jefferson, who's a friend of the Baptist, and Patrick Henry and these other guys. Uh, so that's, that's why America is different. That's another exception to the rule that America has. Um, but again, uh, the odds many times are against us uh, throughout the world. Uh, every Christian that's trying to live for God is in the minority, and he's also a target of the enemy. And you've got to remember that our weapons of our warfare, they're not physical or fleshly, but they're spiritual. And our daily victory in the Christian life and in the ministry comes from praying, preaching, and relying on the promises of God. Amen. Every Christian soldier has to do that. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, Jonathan said uh, to his armor bearer, he said this, he said, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised Philistines. In other words, they're going to go to battle against them. They're the enemy. And he says, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He says, God can win this battle for us with a few of us or a lot of us. It doesn't matter. But God's going to get the glory. Let me say thirdly this. Fight on no matter what the outcome. Fight on no matter what the outcome. Uh, their victory was assured, um, but uh, that was not always the case. Um, you take, uh, Lord said here in this chapter, he said, you're going to win. So they had the promise of God uh, that they were going to win this battle. But let me say this. It's not always 
the outcome is not always going to be a win for you in the Christian life. I uh, look back at uh, Daniel chapter 3. You look at uh, the three Hebrew children, which we kind of almost got to this morning in Sunday school. And when they were thrown in the fiery furnace, uh, they said this. They, they, basically, the king said to them, he said, you, you bow before my image and we'll take you out. You bow before my image and you won't have to go to the fiery furnace. We won't execute you. They said this. They said, if God delivers us, fine. If he doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. I paraphrase that. That's basically what they said. It doesn't matter what the outcome is, we're still going to do the right thing and we're going to still trust our God. And if we live or die, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and so we got to remember that when you get in the battle, you're going to get hit, you're going to get cut, and you're going to get hurt when you get in the battle for the Lord. Uh, even in the face of certain defeat or possible failure, you and I need to do our best because we need to fight on no matter what the odds and no matter what the outcome might be. Uh, look at the martyrs of history. Uh, it's said of those who died uh, in the Roman Colosseum who were literally eaten by lions that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. That is, people saw them dying for their faith and many of them thought, man, I want what they got. And many people were saved and became Christians because of those who died as martyrs. Uh, let me say this, uh, you know, no matter what the outcome is, win or lose, if you lose, let me say this, your failures don't have to define you. Your failures don't have to define you. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, some people are even going to fall into sin and make a mess of things. But guess what? You can get back up. You can get right with God again. You can get back in the fight. You may not be in the same place or the same position or the same capacity, but you can still get back up and support the war effort for Jesus Christ and for souls. Amen. Um, David fell, but he got right with God. And God still used him and he wrote the book of Psalms. <clears throat> Noah wound up drunk one night. Uh, Abraham lied at one point. Daniel succumbed to popularity. Uh, Peter denied the Lord three times. But then later on he preached at Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved. So all the, all the men in the Bible are fallible. All the women in the Bible are fallible. But you know what? What made them a good Christian and a great believer was the fact that they got back up and they kept on going. They fought on, amen. They're going to finish the fight. Um, people don't remember your... People, you know, people um, won't remember your failures if you keep on trying to succeed. If you keep trying to fight, they won't forget that they won't remember that. Um, Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs, which was the record for decades. 714 home runs. How many people remember how many times he struck out? He struck out at least twice as many times as he got a home run. But nobody remembers that. You have to find him his victories, not his failures. Um, then uh, you take um, failure or defeat isn't always final. As long as you're living, there's hope for a better day tomorrow. So if you're here today and you're living and breathing, guess what? There's hope for you tomorrow to still live for God and be right with the Lord. God will bless you. No matter what you've done or how many times you've fallen. Uh, if you fall, you don't have to remain a failure. Uh, if you get knocked down, you don't have to stay down. You can get back up. Amen? And failure, by the way, they say is evidence that you tried. Somebody who never failed probably never tried. So try, amen? Um, sometimes, however, your failures do define you. Um, and if they do define you, then sometimes your failures define you in a positive way. So if you do lose, if you do fall in battle, then uh, suffer defeat with dignity. Um, many times a soldier has to be sacrificed and has to die for the battle to be won. Uh, many units were killed because of the bigger picture. Uh, there's going to be casualties, there's going to be fatalities, but that doesn't mean that you failed. And in the Christian life, you're going to have... Casualties, you're going to have fatalities. You may suffer them yourself. That doesn't mean you failed, as long as you tried. Um, there's a famous battle in 480 BC called the Battle of Thermopylae. In that battle, 300 Spartans, think about this, 300 Spartan soldiers held off 1 million Persian soldiers for three days. How did they do that? Well, they had them in a, they had them in a, in a, in a, in a closed-in area there, like a, 
like a like a between two ridges or whatever, and they could control that. It was like a choke point. They kept them out, and uh, they saved uh, the Greeks from being uh, lost to the to the Persians. One of the greatest standoffs and sacrifices and uh, feats of bravery in the world, and they won, even though many of them died. Um, the Bible says in one place, "Put on the whole armor of God, that you may withstand." in the day of evil, and having done all to stand. In other words, put the armor of God on, which Ephesians 6 tells you what it's all about. Put that on. Why? So that you can withstand when that evil day comes. And having done everything you can do, you're still standing at the end. Um, the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You know what you do with the bully? You stand up to the bully. Amen? You stand up to the bully, and uh, usually they'll go away and leave you alone. Resist the devil, and he'll leave you alone. How do you resist the devil? You've got to resist the devil in the faith. You've got to be saved and know the word of God. Let me say this, number four, fight on no matter what others do or don't do. Fight on what others do or don't do. Uh, whether they go with you or not. Whether they do right or not. Whether it's a great work or a small work, it doesn't matter. Uh, Ahab spared the enemy in one place, and he disobeyed the Lord. Um, and then uh, Peter, um, at one point, asked John... Uh, asked, asked what John was... Uh, the Lord said to Peter in John 21, I think it was, He said to Peter, He said, you know, basically, you're going to die on a cross for me one day. That's what's going to happen to you. And then Peter says, Oh, okay. Uh, what's John going to do? He's your favorite. He said, well, I, Whatever he does is not your business. He said, Your business is to do what you're supposed to do. You fight your battles... You fight uh, and, and try to win your battle. You run your race in your lane. Don't worry about him. And so that's what you're supposed to do. Do what, whatever God's put you in, the places he's put you at, what he's given you to do. It doesn't matter what he's given somebody else to do. He's given you a responsibility. Just do what you're supposed to do. Find your niche and get in it. Amen. And do something for God. Uh, some people are going to fall in battle or desert the battle. Uh, some well-respected men of God have failed and fell out of the ministry. There's good church members that have fallen out of church and not got back in. Why? Many times because of the pressures of life, sometimes the pleasures of sin. Uh, they've gone after the almighty dollar, and they've made money, honestly or dishonestly, but it got them out of the battle. Uh, they've gone back to the bottle, the pills, or the needle or something, and uh, they couldn't get victory over that. And now they're stuck at home someplace, and they don't go to church. Uh, they've dabbled with uh, sexual sin and fallen to that. Uh, some have gotten scared, some have gotten tired, some have just simply suffered from combat fatigue, amen. And they left the church and just simply went home to rest and haven't come back yet. Hey, the Bible said this is not the place of your rest. Amen. If you're still living and breathing, you can still serve God, amen. amen. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. The um, Bible talked about one group there in the book of Psalm 68. It says, being armed, they turned back in the day of battle. There was a tribe there that they were armed. They were ready to fight, but they turned in battle and they ran. You don't want to be one of, the, one of those that runs, amen? And by the way, when you, put, when you put on the whole armor of God, there's nothing described for your back, which means don't turn your back on the enemy, amen? Right. If you get in a fight, a real fight, you never turn your back on the enemy, amen? Or your assailant. That's dangerous. You never do that. And that's what they did. Some will betray the cause and they'll even betray you. Benedict Arnold, who was the hero of Ticonderoga, during the revolution, thought America had lost the war, and he was mistaken. But you know what he did? He sold out to the enemy. He betrayed America. He even tried to uh, have George Washington kidnapped at West Point, which failed. And then he was on the run after that, never could come back home to America. He sold out to the enemy, and he chose the wrong side because America won, but he was a traitor. And when anybody thinks of a traitor today, they think of Judas Iscariot, and they think of Benedict Arnold. Um, Paul said this in one place. He said, Many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He said, There's some people that I used to brag on. There were such good ministers and good Christians and Sunday school teachers and deacons and church members. He said, Now I'm weeping over because they've gone the way of the flesh. And he said, Now they're not serving God. They're the enemies of the cross now. They're not even serving God anymore. Uh, there are some who were once soldiers of the cross. Now they're enemies of the cross. Judas Iscariot knew the end was near. He struck a bargain with the devil. He sold out Jesus Christ, and it led him to commit suicide. 
because of the shame and the guilt and the grief. But you know what? I believe Jesus Christ would have forgiven him if he'd gone to him and repented of it. But he didn't do that. He just got depressed and got uh, messed up in his head and his heart, and he went out and committed suicide. Thought there was no help. But there is always. If you're living and breathing, there's still hope. Amen? Amen. Uh, let me say this. Uh, the enemy's not going to surrender. The enemy's not going to surrender. Uh, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, and at the end of that thousand year uh, uh, millennial reign of Christ, the Bible said he's going to be let out, and he's going to lead another rebellion when he gets out. But the Lord's going to defeat him, the Bible tells us that. Amen? But you know what? Uh, Satan's never going to admit that the war was lost. He's not going to lie down and quit. He's going to keep on fighting. And so he's going to keep on fighting you and me and the church. So we've got to keep on fighting. Amen? Let me say this finally. Fight on. I said this. Fight on no matter what people may say. And then fight on no matter what the odds are. Fight on no matter what the outcome. Fight on no matter what others do or don't do. And then fight on simply no matter what. Just fight on no matter what. I'll give you a closing illustration here. On December 16, 1944, the Germans launched their largest offensive of the war on the Western Front. The primary goals of the offensive were to capture the Belgian port of Antwerp and to drive a wedge between the British and the American armies. This offensive is often referred to as the Battle of the Bulge. The town of Bastion is strategically located at the center of the road network of the Ardennes. Uh, the majority of roads in that region of the Ardennes pass through this town, Bastion. The town's strategic location made it vitally important to the outcome of the offensive. The Allies, that is the Americans and the British and the French, the Allies realized the importance, and General Eisenhower dispatched the 101st Airborne Division, uh, the Screaming Eagles, to go and hold the town at all costs. Well, the 101st Airborne got into Bastion late on the night of December 18th. 1944. They weren't well equipped, having just gotten out of combat in Holland. They were particularly short of winter clothing and footwear, and here it is Christmas time. Uh, at that time, they were not able to receive air supply because the weather was absolutely terrible. It was very, very cold and snowy. Visibility was often measured in yards. The Americans were low on ammunition. They were surrounded, outnumbered, and outgunned by the Germans. And it looks like the end was coming. On the 21st of, November, of, De of December, they became completely surrounded by the Germans, and while they were still surrounded on the morning of December 22nd, a German surrender party consisting of two officers and two NCOs and carrying a white flag approached the U.S. Army perimeter. The party was taken to a nearby platoon command post. While the enlisted men were detained, the officers were blindfolded and taken to the command post where they presented their surrender ultimatum to the American commander. One of those German uh, officers was educated in America and spoke perfect English and understood English. So he was, he was also a translator. Um, the ultimatum, in essence, said that the 101st Airborne's position was hopeless and that if they elected not to surrender, a lot of bad things are going to happen to them. The message went up the chain of command from one officer to another and finally to the acting division commander, General McAuliffe. General McAuliffe was told that they had received a German surrender ultimatum. The general's first reaction was that the Germans wanted to surrender to the U.S., but was quickly informed otherwise. In other words, when he got that message, he said, oh, they want to surrender to us? And they said, no, General, they want us to surrender to them. And so... Uh, He's informed of that, and he's told that the Germans have demanded the U.S. Army surrender. When McAuliffe heard that, he laughed and said, Us surrender? Oh, nuts. Which means no. Um, and so this is what was sent to the U.S. commander of the encircled town of Bastion. The fortune of war is changing. This time, the United States forces in and never shown have been encircled by strong German armored units. There's only one possibility to save the encircled U.S. Army troops from total annihilation, and that is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. We'll give you two hours to think it over, and then if you don't surrender, we will annihilate the U.S. Army troops in and near Rostion, signed the German commander. And so here is the reply to the German commander. Nuts! Signed, the American commander. <laughs> and then the German commander asked his 
English speaking lieutenant, he said, what does that mean? I'll let you look it up. <laughs> anyway, uh, in his Christmas message to his troops, General McAuliffe said this, because they were still there on Christmas Day. They didn't get relieved until the day after Christmas when Patton shows up. But anyway, in his Christmas message to his troops, General McAuliffe said this, Allied troops are counterattacking in force. We continue to hold Bastion. By holding Bastion, we assure the success of the Allied armies. We know that our division commander will say, when this is all over and done, well done. Think about that. We're in, a, we're in an army. We're soldiers for the Lord. Amen? Right. And we're fighting the good fight of faith. We're reading our Bibles. We're praying. We're going to church. We're trying to witness. We're trying to spread the gospel. We're trying to have an influence for Christ in the world around us. And if we keep doing that, no matter what, even if we're surrounded, outnumbered, outgunned, even if the, if the enemy just says you need to surrender now, don't surrender. Die with your boots on. Die in the fight. Finish the fight. Don't quit. Whether you live or die, don't quit the fight for the Lord. Amen? And if you do die in this fight, you go directly to heaven. Amen? Not because you died in the fight, but because you're saved. Amen. Okay? Um, so I hope that one day our division commander might say to us, well done. And if you read your Bible, the Bible tells us that our commander, the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, will one day say to those who were faithful in the fight and faithful to serve him in their Christian life, one day he's going to say to you and I, if we've done well, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And so no matter what the battle looks like, no matter what the enemy may say, don't get frightened. Don't get afraid. If you do, just trust in the Lord. Keep on going. Keep on fighting. And again, die with your boots on as a Christian. Amen. And live for the Lord till the day you take your last breath. And if you do that, God's your commander, Christ, your commander, is going to one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed while the piano player comes and plays for us. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we've had to come to church uh, this weekend, Father, uh, this Independence Day weekend. We thank you for the liberties that we have in America. We thank you for the founding of our nation. We thank you, God, for your hand in it. And, Father, we do confess to you today as uh, church members, as Christians, as Americans, that, God, you are our God. You said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God, today, we as a church... Uh, Father, we confess that you are our God. And Father, as Americans, we pray for our country. We intercede for it, that God, our country, might come back to thee and receive your blessings. Father, we do pray also that, uh, Lord, you'd help us to keep occupying, keep fighting, keep serving you till the day we die. Lord, help us to be in our, in our places every week uh, at church and, and our place out in the world as a witness for you, as a testimony for you. Help us, Lord, not to ever give in. Uh, or give up in this fight. And God, give us grace, we pray, and strength to do that. Father, we pray, God, now that you might uh, bless the invitation time. If there's anybody that's lost that needs to be saved, I pray, God, for them that you'd open their heart to the gospel. They might receive Christ as their Savior and know they have eternal life. And God, if there's any Christian father who has fallen and slackened off, Lord, in his service to you, that she or he, God, would, Lord, today uh, recommit themselves to you. Uh, and decide to serve you to the best of their ability. God, help each of us today to rededicate ourselves to you this morning. Uh, God, to serve you better and serve you the best we can. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The hedge bow and eyes closed while he plays. This altar is open if you need to use it to pray. Maybe you're here today and uh, you're unsaved. Salvation is in trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross to pay for your sin. If you'll accept Jesus Christ when he did for you on the cross, then God will accept you. It's not a matter of church membership or denomination or baptism. It's a matter of faith. And that is, do you believe that you're a sinner and you need a forgiveness? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins so you could be forgiven? If you'll trust Christ on that basis, he'll forgive you and save you and give you eternal life. If you're here today and you're a Christian, are you in the fight? in the battle? Are you engaging the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil? Are you being the witness and the testimony that you ought to be for Christ at home, on the job?
job, in the gym, at school, where it might be. Don't be ashamed of what you are as a Christian. Don't be ashamed of your Bible. Don't be ashamed of Christ. That's what the enemy wants you to do. He's, again, the enemy wants to psych you out. It's a psychological, mental game he's playing with. He'll use people to do that. He wants you to be quiet. He wants you to stay in the corner, in the dark, and not let your light shine. If the Lord wants you to do that, you'll, you'll feel strengthened when you do that. Maybe you feel weak today, but I guarantee you the first time you step out with Christ, you're going to be strengthened and encouraged. And you're going to say, man, why didn't I do this before? Living the Christian life is I'll be joyful. It can be fun. It can be interesting. It can be never a dull moment if you're serving God. So don't quit the fight. If you're out, if you're, if you're on the sidelines, if you're out of combat right now, uh, maybe you got hurt, maybe you got injured somehow spiritually, ask God to help you get healed of that. And then don't stay out of combat. Get back in the fight. Amen. Get back in the game and serve the Lord. Tear for a few more moments. If no one comes to the altar, we'll close the prayer. Amen. Aren't you look this away? I hope that uh, you got something today that will help you. This week and next week and next month and next year, amen. And I hope that it will help strengthen you and stiffen you up as a Christian so that you'll be a better soldier for the Lord, amen. Uh, God needs some good soldiers these days. Well, let's be dismissed in prayer. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. We're glad for our visitors that are here today as well. Appreciate all those who have uh, uh, contributed by bringing food and uh, some goodies today and done the cooking and all that kind of stuff, put the tents up and everything. Uh, appreciate everybody that's done that in our church. And uh, so we're looking forward to having a good time this afternoon. So we, we'll be dismissed in prayer. And when you pray, please ask God to bless our food and fellowship to follow. Brother Jerry, would you do that for us? Lord, thank you for this message.